Okay, we're going to talk about the, uh, the focused assessment by sonography and trauma uh, exam today. And uh, that's uh, often abbreviated to the FAST exam in English. So the uh, lecture outline, the, what the lecture is going to con consist of is uh, look at the protocol. Uh, what's normal and how does it look? What's abnormal and how does it look? Pearls and pitfalls. Okay, and then we'll integrate the whole thing in the trauma evaluation at the end. 
So first of all, to look at the rationale and pro protocol, um, just remember that at the outset, the FAST is looking for evidence of injury. Um, we're not actually looking for the organs that injured themselves. We're looking for indirect evidence, which is going to be free fluid in abnormal locations. So there's quite a lot of work been done on this. And uh, as you can see, here's a, a review of 10 of the, the bigger articles in, in the English literature, at least. And um, you can see that seven out of the 10 have been done by, by non-radiologists, uh, by clinicians, uh, either emergency physicians or, or predominantly surgeons. Um, and you can see that the sensitivity and specificity here kind of runs in the 80 to 90 range for sensitivity and 90 to 100 range for specificity. So let's just think about the, the, uh, the use of FAST compared to CT. Uh, there's going to be no radiation involved. There's no contrast. It's fairly rapid to perform. It's repeatable. It can be done without taking the patient out of the resuscitation area. It's fairly inexpensive and becoming increasingly inexpensive with technological advances. Um, we're not going to get any organ-specific information, unlike the CT scan. And retroperitoneal injuries tend to be missed on ultrasound, so be aware of that. Compared to DPL, which is uh, something that's rarely used now in the United States, but in parts of the world where CT is less available, it's still an option. Um, we're going to have a non-invasive study. Uh, it's going to be rapid again, probably much faster to do a fast exam than a DPL. It's repeatable, uh, uh, unlike the, uh, the DPL. Uh, the cost is relatively low. Um, this information about the pleural and pericardial space is available for the FAST exam, but uh, is, is not available in the DPL. Um, and the DPL uh, does give us information about hollow viscous injuries, whereas the, uh, that's an area that the FAST exam is weak. So um, what are we going to use to do the FAST exam? Uh, ideally, a, f a small footprint probe, because a lot of the scanning tends to be done between the ribs. Um, so you can actually use this cardiac phased array probe as well. Um, if not, a general purpose abdominal uh, probe is used by many people very successfully. Uh, you're going to be running in the 2 to 5 megahertz range for a frequency. Well, let's just think a moment. Since we're looking for free fluid, what's going to happen if you get release of free fluid into the abnormal spaces of the peritoneum? Um, and just looking at a sagittal view here, you can see that in this area, around L5, the uh, the peri there's like a, 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 a watershed in the peritoneal cavity. And anything that bleeds north of this or superior to it is going to flow no northwards towards the diaphragm. And anything that bleeds, uh, and, and ultimately it's going to pool right here behind the diaphragm in this space down here. And conversely, anything that bleeds below this level is going to pool in the pelvis and be identified down here in the pelvis. As you can see, the pelvis is actually a lower sp spot than the, uh, uh, the subphrenic areas around the kidneys on either side. But despite that, there's many more sources of bleeding in the upper abdomen, so blood is much commoner in supine patients uh, at the, uh, in, in this area than down in the pelvis. If we now consider the same uh, concept in a transverse plane, and here we are at the level of the kidneys on a CT scan, you can see that anything that's on the right of the vertebral body is going to pull down between the kidney and the liver down here and this space around here. Um, and anything on the left is likely to, to uh, pull in the analogous space between the spleen and the kidney uh, on the patient's left. Um, since this area, since the spleen and the hilum of the spleen is actually inside the lesser sac, and this is a fairly tight volume, frequently blood that forms here actually flows across here and is also found in the right upper quadrant in the spleno, sorry, the hepatorenal space. And uh, so you will find uh, oftentimes that this a positive free fluid exam in the right upper quadrant, even though the bleeding the source is the spleen. Uh, finally, um, the other space that we will be examining is the pleural space down here, just so that we don't forget it, which is uh, one of the uh, common source of, of, of uh, abnormal free fluid when there's blunt abdominal trauma. Um, so the way to think about this is that 
there are, although there are four windows, and these are the four which are, are frequently described here, there are actually ten spaces that we actually have to evaluate when we're, when we're assessing these patients. And it's really the ten potential spaces that uh, are really the focus of our, of our inquiry and our examination. So in the right upper quadrant, there are four. In the sub xiphoid region, there's one. In the left upper quadrant region, there's another four. In fact, the same analogous four to in region one. And finally, in the suprapubic region, there will be one space. So that adds up to 10. Let's go through the, the, the potential space in the right upper quadrant. Going from the top, they're going to be plural, subphrenic, heptorenal, which is also known as Morrison's, and infrarenal. The one space that we're going to examine in the sub uh, region is the uh, pericardial space. In the left upper quadrant is the same four spaces as there were in the right upper quadrant, pleural, subphrenic, splenorenal on this side, and infrarenal. Finally, in the suprapubic region, we're going to look at one space, which is this retrovesicular space, space or pouch of Douglas, uh, depending on whether you're looking in a man or a woman, respectively. So let's just consider now what, what does a normal fast exam look like um, uh, and, uh, and what, what, what is the appearance of normal. So uh, studying in the first region, the right upper quadrant, usually you're going to be, have to put your probe intercostal. But you might try putting it subcostal here in the midclavicular line and using the liver as a sonographic window. If you have a cooperative patient, and many, many trauma patients obviously not able to be cooperative, you can ask the patient to take slow, deep breaths to bring the liver down to help you uh, uh, provide a sonographic window. If you use the intercostal spaces, which is by far the majority of cases you will need to do that, uh, you're going to try and angle the probe parallel with the ribs, uh, which in shorthand we say 10 o'clock. If the patient's head's at 12 o'clock, the probe pointer is going to be up in this uh, upward, rightward direction here. So the four spaces that you can look for here, and you can see them in this image, are first of all the pleural space, again going from the top, this is the patient's head, the patient's feet. Um, the pleural space, and this is the diaphragm, this bright white line here. The subphrenic space, which is on the other side of the, the bright white line of the diaphragm. The heptorenal space, which is Morrison's, which actually in this patient goes almost all the way around the kidney. And then finally, we want to check the inferior pole of the kidney here for for blood tracking up along the colic gutter. They're really seen on a single view as in, as in this case um, and we usually have to image them separately. So first of all, considering the pleural space, the key finding here is to identify mirror artifact right here. Uh, the presence of, uh, of the mirror artifact is actually caused by uh, the intensely echogenic diaphragm which provides a very good specular reflector. It gives the appearance of liver on the other side of the diaphragm. If that's absent, if you get black back here instead of the appearance of liver, then you should be suspicious that you've got free fluid in the pleural space uh, and in the context of trauma that would usually be a hemothorax. Uh, the subphrenic space is just on the other side of the diaphragm. Occasionally we see free fluid here and once your eyes trained on the diaphragm you may as well check for it while you're, you're, you're reviewing this spot. Next, to get to, the, um, to Morrison's pouch, which is, in terms of intra-abdominal free fluid, the commonest site to identify it on the FAST exam. Uh, in transverse view, this is a, uh, a view of the kidney right here, liver, diaphragm again, and this would be Morrison's pouch. In the, in the uh, sagittal longitudinal view, this right here is Morrison's pouch, where we're looking for free fluid. Finally, check the inferior pole of the kidney, which is nicely seen in this patient right here without even having to move the probe. This is a, a live uh, a clip of a FAST exam. You can see first of all we're imaging the, 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 the Morrison's pouch right here. And then there are nice images of the diaphragm here uh, with, the, with uh, above the diaphragm the mirror artifact easily seen right in here. Um, this is, this, this, the rib shadows here are somewhat distracting and in this exam uh, a, a, a better quality exam would have been obtained if, if the examiner had managed to make the probe uh, angled more in parallel with the ribs. Moving on now to the second region, uh, the pericardial space. Uh, most commonly we use the sub window for this. 
and the probe needs to be placed immediately below the, the xiphoid. Uh, and oftentimes you actually place the probe on the chest and just slide it down over the xiphoid. Uh, you need the hepatic window to identify the heart. So again, if a cooperative patient can help you out, you can ask them to take a deep breath and hold, a deep breath and hold or just take steady deep breaths. You want to aim the probe towards the patient's left shoulder up in this direction here. And a mistake that's frequently made is that people forget that the heart and the mediastinum are immediately right behind the sternum. So you have to keep this probe pretty much parallel with the sternum and, and uh, depress the whole probe to get underneath the xiphoid process here to get your images. Okay. Uh, the pointer in this, in this view is going to be over to the patient's right here uh, at 9 o'clock using the, the previously described shorthand. So when you get the probe in this position here again, pointer over here towards the patient's right, uh, you're going to get an image like this with the right ventricle closest to the probe, the left ventricle behind it, you can see this white line of the septum here and then the right atrium and left atrium relating to those two. Here's a, an, a clip showing this, the same thing right here. Um, and you can see right here, right ventricle, left ventricle, septum right here. You're actually catching a little bit of the aortic valve right here and not seeing the left atrium so well. And here's the, the right atrium back here with the tricuspid valve between. The space that we're really interested here that we're interrogating is the pericardial space which is signaled by this bright white line and also back here as well. So this white line will be separated by black in cases when you have pericardial fluid. Now some people advocate turning the probe to 12 o'clock, turning the probe so that it's pointing towards the patient's head, the sub xiphoid view. Uh, it gives uh, it also gives a view of the inferior vena cava and it gives the pericardium adjacent to the liver and the diaphragm uh, on that view. Uh, technically it's oftentimes a little bit more difficult because it's even harder to get the probe under the patient's cyphoid and behind the sternum when it's oriented in this direction. But this is what the view looks like. Here's the inferior vena cava, here's the, the liver right here, the diaphragm, and this is the heart right in here. And uh, this, is, this is the image that you're going to get on this view. If you're unable to obtain images from the sub xiphoid view, which might be the case if you have abdominal injuries, wounds, uh, or if you have a very protuberant abdomen, then use parasternal views as needed. So that, moving on to the third region here, we're getting to the left upper quadrant now. This is technically the most challenging view. Um, you're going to angle the probe parallel to the ribs. Uh, again, usually this is going to be on this side, it's going to be towards the head of the ribs in the two o'clock position. Um, as a general sort of pearl here, the, the position that the probe will be placed in is going to be more posterior and more cephalad, more towards the patient's head than most clinicians expect. Um, if you're too far inferior, uh, you're not going to be able to image the structures because there's going to be the, the descending colon in the way, and that's all you're going to be able to see. So uh, again, uh, to obtain the, the, the images of the various structures, you often need to go through, uh, up and down through several rib spaces, and you can see here again how the probe is kind of angled parallel to the ribs. So the potential spaces we mentioned before are four, starting at the top. On the t above the diaphragm, there's going to be the, the pleural space, and the absence of fluid here is going to be signaled by the same mirror artifact we saw on the right. Below the diaphragm is the spleen, and there's a splenophrenic space here, the subphrenic space uh, is also a potential space for free fluid. Uh, below that, the kidney and the space between those, the splenorenal space. And then finally, the inferior pole of the kidney should be checked, again, for free fluid coming up the left colic gutter or pooling down here. Uh, behind the kidney, the psoas muscle is frequently seen, as in this case, and should not be confused with free fluid. Here is a clip of the left upper quadrant exam. A uh, little on the dark side, again, we're having rib artifacts frequently coming across the images here. Um, here's the diaphragm back here. Here's the spleen right here. And 
Uh, here's the splenorenal space with some perinephric fat with internal echoes which distinguishes it from blood. And every now and then we get an image here above the, above the diaphragm of mirror artifact, uh, which on this image might be a little hard to see because uh, at least it's in this particular version, uh, it seems to be projecting a little bit dark. So finally, moving on to the fourth region that we're going to examine, we're going to look at the suprapubic space. Um, and in the male, it's going to be, we're looking uh, uh, the retrovesicle, the rectovesicle, sorry, space, and in the female, the rectouterine space. Um, in the female, we'll also be looking at the, uh, the vesico-uterine space anterior to the uterus as well. Sometimes you see free fluid there. Uh, the rectouterine space is known as the pouch of Douglas uh, and frequently referred to as that um, in, in women. So you're going to put the probe immediately above the pubic symphysis. It's like the xiphoid here. You kind of want to put the probe on the bone and then just slide over it um, because you, m you get the most use out of the, the bladder window if it's available. If you have your, your probe uh, placed as inferior as possible, you can actually make use of a small, a very small bladder in that, in that case. As you can see here, the, uh, the probe is in the transverse plane is oriented towards the patient's right, the 9 o'clock view. Uh, you're going to start with your probe angled cordially down into the pelvis here, and then you're going to steadily scan superiorly by fanning the probe your hand back in this direction so the probe fans superiorly uh, in the male through the seminal vesicles in the female around the level of the cervix the, uh, we'll talk about one of the pitfalls of this exam in a moment um, and then uh, you're going to scan north to the dome of the bladder uh, you want to scan before the foley is placed and if uh, if if uh, there's an urgency to placing the foley, the, uh, the usual order of the FAST exam uh, can be uh, changed to do the, do the suprapubic scan before the foley is placed because uh, the bladder is an important window to identify fluid. Uh, the, uh, although the primary view here is transverse, uh, sagittal and parasagittal longitudinal views can also be helpful especially if there's any question about what you're looking at. You want to systematically scan uh, from inferior to posterior as we've mentioned uh, and free fluid may be seen either behind, above or anterior to the bladder in any of those places. So the normal view uh, in the male, this is the transverse view in the male and back here you're seeing seminal vesicles. This is the sagittal view in the male uh, his prostate and seminal vesicles are on either side of the scanning plane so they're not seen in this midline sagittal view. This is the bladder here providing the window. In the female, uh, th this level you can see the uterus right here and behind that this echogenic structure is the, the rectum and you're going to be looking for fluid on either side here in little triangles is the earliest sign of free fluid in the pelvis in the female. This is the longitudinal view in the female pelvis. Uh, here is the bladder. Uh, the vaginal stripe can be seen right here. It's usually characteristically echogenic line between two hypoechoic uh, structures, which are the vaginal walls. And then the, the cervix is actually down here in this patient, um, and free fluid will be down here and oftentimes runs up here along posterior to the cervix and the body, the uterus right here. Um, this is a patient's bladder is, is fairly empty uh, and uh, obviously some, some women have uh, retroflexed uteruses uh, which will not show up on this, on this scan. This is a transverse clip of the suprapubic exam in the male. Uh, at the beginning of the clip we see, and we're just about to get back to it to run it one more time, the beginning of the clip here is the prostate. Uh, uh, scanning superiorly, we get to the seminal vesicles, which become symmetrical structures on both sides of the bladder. Um, and finally, we're going to scan to the dome of the bladder and see no free fluid back in this area. Moving on now to uh, assess abnormal findings in the FAST exam. And we'll go through the same order again just to, to uh, uh, discuss each one in turn. So first of all, looking at the first region we've discussed in the right upper quadrant, uh, which is the pleural space. Um, 
once again, we're looking for mirror artifacts, and this, these two uh, stills demonstrate the loss of mirror artifacts in this characteristic pointy shape down here, and a larger one right here, uh, which represents hemothorax. This is a small, very small hemothorax, and here's a larger one. This is the edge of the lung coming down. You can see after the lung becomes contiguous with the diaphragm up here, you once again have the mirror artifact, okay, that we, we talked about before. So here we have hemothorax right here. Here we can see liver uh, with diaphragm right here. And above that, this pointy area of, of dark fluid, which does not show mirror artifact. Okay, doke. All right, so moving on here, this is the next spaces we're going to look at. Uh, we'll skip over the subphrenic space. Uh, we do have a, an image of subphrenic fluid coming up, but the, the commonest site for finding free fluid in a positive fast exam is in Morrison's pouch, which is the heptorenal space. Here is an image of heptorenal fluid. Here's the kidney, the liver. Uh, and this is a sagittal view. Uh, and transverse, once again, this is a small amount of free fluid, uh, but any free fluid should be identified in this area because it's usually uh, of pathological significance. Diaphragm, liver once again, and transverse view of the kidney now here. This here is not free fluid. This is bowel, which is usually going to be more obvious in real time because you'll see it peristalsis, but you can see the plica circularis characteristic of small bowel right here. Here's a, a clip. Uh, in the transverse view predominantly showing nice mirror artifact back here, diaphragm, liver, and gallbladder up here. But between this transverse view of the kidney and the liver, you can see this strip of, of, of dark free fluid uh, right in here, which represents uh, an intra-abdominal, intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Now moving on to the Next region, region number two, which is looking for the sub cyphoid uh, space. Uh, this clip shows the uh, sub cyphoid four chamber view we discussed. And here is nicely seen a, a rind here, free fluid uh, hemopericardium, which is seen anteriorly to the, the heart and also posteriorly back here. Um, and it's pretty much circumferential. There's an area here in, adjacent to the right atrium where the, the free fluid is not so well seen uh, and, and this, it's thicker and thinner in, in various hearts but it's pretty much pre circumferential free fluid. The classification of pericardial fluid collections traditionally by cardiologists has been really a little bit uh, arcane. Uh, they've, they've categorized as physiological small, moderate, large, very large and tamponade. Each of those has defined measurements and needless to say, for clinicians uh, in practice, uh, such classifications are hard to keep in mind and keep straight, especially in the, the heat of a trauma evaluation. So really, it's easier uh, in, the, in a, a setting of trauma where this, uh, even a small effusion might be uh, very significant if it wasn't there 15 minutes ago before the patient had any trauma, and uh, if it's accumulating at 20 or 30 cc's, a minute, um, and then by the time it it'll only take five minutes to reach a, a critical volume of 100 to 150 cc's. Um, we really just need to think of two different kinds of effusions in trauma. One is effusions that are unrelated to trauma. They're usually small. Uh, they're often adjacent to the right atrium, um, and a cl clinical acumen and uh, will. We'll, a clinical acumen will be, need, will be needed to, to sort this out. Uh, conversely, if they are related to trauma, uh, any size can rapidly expand, as we've mentioned, and the risk of tamponade can occur with any circumferential effusion. So the one we just looked at, if it's acute, would put the patient at risk for rapidly expanding and causing tamponade. So if, if unsure whether the effusion you're looking at is uh, clinically acute or not, um, perform serial exams. That's really the key to this. Um, again, most of the time, the patient will be suggesting that they have a problem by their hemodynamic status uh, because tamponade in 
uh, someone who's had uh, an otherwise normal pericardium up to that point occurs very, very rapidly. This is a case with uh, a pretty massive traumatic effusion. Uh, you can see this atrial collapse here in diastole. Uh, we're not really seeing uh, ventricular collapse, which is a much more specific sign for this, um, since atrial collapse can happen with hypovolemia and various other conditions as well. But uh, with a, a, uh, an, a fusion this large in the setting of trauma, uh, you'd be very concerned for uh, impending tamponade uh, and act accordingly. Moving now to the left upper quadrant, uh, there's going to be, uh, as we mentioned, four potential spaces where we can see fluid. Uh, the commonest one is going to be in the splenorenal space, uh, and the second most common is going to be in, in the pleural space signaling hemothorax. Once again, diaphragm, spleen, potential space here with pointy black fluid. Here we have spleen, diaphragm uh, above it, and here we can see the lung outlined by hemothorax right here. Here is a clip showing uh, it's a fairly um, uh, subtle free fluid, but you can see it above and below the spleen right here, um, and also spreading, spreading around here. We'll discuss this clip a little bit uh, more extensively later, but this actually is fluid-filled stomach, not kidney. Um, but nevertheless, outside that, you can see pointy collections of free fluid extending around the spleen, both under the diaphragm and up in this direction right here. There's also a pretty extensive clot here. And uh, again, the, it, the inexperienced eye, this clot might just have the same density as soft tissue, but actually, um, uh, with experience, can be, can be distinguished and, and recognized as such. This is another... Uh, positive left upper quadrant exam. Again, a little bit of free fluid uh, just hanging out here at the, the uh, superior pole of the spleen and maybe just creeping up a little bit here in the splenorenal space. Uh, here we can see the shadowing caused by the lung and uh, you can see how technically this view can be quite difficult because the spleen gives you much less smaller window than the liver does on the other side. So it's hard to get in to get a view of this, but this is a, a positive fast exam in the left upper quadrant. Moving on to the suprapubic region, uh, here's the bladder, and this is free fluid posterior to the bladder right here. Um, small amounts before the, the rectum gets, gets pushed away from the bladder by the, the free fluid here, small amounts appear as triangles on either side here, and that's often referred to as a bow tie sign. This is a sagittal view. This here is actually the prostate and caught the seminal vesicles, so this is actually not truly sagittal. This is a parasagittal longitudinal view. But this here is free fluid back here. Uh, again, the, the appearance of free fluid is much, much clearer when you look in real time. This is a transverse view of the bladder in a female. This is the uterus here. We just scan up through the bladder, and all through the this space up here, we're seeing free fluid floating around the, the bowel right here. This is bladder, the dome of the bladder. And once again, lots of free fluid back here, posterior to the uterus, which is right here, and in between the uh, loops of bowel. Okay, let's just think about some of the pearls and pitfalls of uh, the FAST exam. Starting again, just running through the uh, the four regions to keep, to keep our... Uh, uh, keep keep this theme going. Um, patient positioning uh, does make a difference, uh, especially for uh, fluid in the right upper quadrant, and that's been demonstrated in a couple of different ways. Uh, actually, Dr. Goldberg, in one of the earliest studies on this subject, uh, using uh, cadavers and peritoneal dialysis models, showed that he could reliably uh, identify uh, as little as 100 cc's um, by putting the patient in the right side down to cubitus position which uh, uh, is, is something that we rarely actually do in the trauma evaluation, but it's maybe something we should consider doing. And uh, certainly if the patient's being turned uh, to examine their spine, when they turn onto their right side, it might be an opportunity if a sonographer is available to examine Morrison's pouch to get a better look at that space. Uh, in terms of Trendelenburg positioning, uh, uh, a study was done in 1999 by Dr. Abrams, and she actually showed that 
uh, using a DPL model, a, a model of patients receiving DPL, that she could reliably identify uh, uh, a volume of 440 cc's of free, free uh, of a fluid infused from the DPL versus about 50% uh, more when the patient was supine without any Trendelenburg. So again, this is actually a, a real case. The patient had a question of free fluid here in Morrison's pouch. You can just see a very subtle black line between these, these two echogenic uh, fascial planes here. And the patient was put in Trendelenburg and lo and behold, the free fluid got larger and we uh, were able to diagnose uh, the, the uh, hemoperitoneum um, uh, earlier that way and, and uh, expedite the patient's care. Another pitfall of, of scanning the right of quadrant plane is that uh, people often have a tendency to scan right down at the bed here on the right, the right side. And the problem with that is that if you have free fluid pooling back here and you're scanning too low down, then your probe and your imaging plane might actually go across here and be superior to the, the, the collection of free fluid. There's a couple of things that you can do to avoid this. Uh, first of all, consider scanning, um, or uh, just as a matter of course, whenever you scan, you should scan the whole space. Don't just get one image of the liver and kidney. Um, you'll hear this as a re repeated theme in this lecture, but the power of, of bedside ultrasonography in the hands of clinicians is that we can do this in real time. And one of the good habits that we need to develop is that we scan through all the tissue planes of the organs or the, the areas that we're interested in. So um, systematic real-time scanning through all tissue planes might, will save you this if you go through the whole area, the, the whole uh, heptorenal region as well as, as the, the uh, pleural regions and the other regions you evaluate in the FAST exam. Secondly, um, try to put your probe as anterior as possible. This is slightly counterintuitive because this actually moves your probe away from the area where the free fluid is going to be. Um, and people feel that they should be as close as possible to it to see it. But you get a better view down here. And since fluid is going to be pooling down here, by being up here, you're actually looking down at the dependent areas when someone's supine on a stretcher. Thirdly, you might uh, want to consider using the transverse plane. The transverse plane, in, as opposed to the longitudinal plane, is going to catch everything that's more posterior because it's at right angles to this entire potential space back here. And this is, a, once again, a, the view we've already seen of a transverse view of the kidney. You can tell by the shape of the kidney here um, with a small amount of free fluid here and the liver around it. So this is a, a, a transverse view with a small amount of fluid that if, if the probe in, had, had missed this in a longitudinal plane, uh, might easily have, have overlooked this area of free fluid here. So uh, what about the evaluation of the pleura uh, by the right upper quadrant? Um, uh, and, and likewise for the left upper quadrant, uh, how sensitive is, is the FAST exam for hemothorax? So um, in 1997, one study of this showed a sensitivity of 96% and a specificity of 100%, essentially identical to that of chest X-ray. Um, I think this is probably, uh, it was a small study, but it's probably pretty accurate. Um, people who, who've done quite a bit of scanning know that they can see uh, really minuscule amounts of fluid in the pleural space, um, especially uh, um, uh, if one scans the whole way through the, the pleural space, um, and great views are available through the liver. So very small uh, uh, volumes of fluid are, are identifiable. Uh, whether they be hemothorax or pleural effusion. Um, the, uh, uh, the sensitivity seen in this uh, study, an earlier study by Rothlin, um, showed a lower sensitivity, but many of the false negatives were because people actually said they forgot to look, um, and then others uh, because the hemothorax was delayed in presentation, which obviously um, is something that the ultrasound is, is never going to be able to predict the development of a hemothorax uh, after the ultrasound. The differentiation of pleural fusion uh, from uh, hemothorax is similar to the differentiation of CITES from hemoperitoneum, and we'll talk a little about that coming up. In the sub xiphoid view, uh, one of the, the, the pitfalls or things to watch out for, a protuberant abdomen uh, is obviously going to be an impediment to doing this exam, as, as are abdominal wall injury and tenderness. 
Um, the, uh, one of the other things that is frequently overlooked is that in the sub xiphoid view, the depth required uh, to see the, the, the posterior wall of the pericardial sac is much greater than, than is commonly used in the right upper quadrant. So don't forget to adjust your depth and, and gain settings when you do your sub xiphoid exam. Uh, one of the pitfalls is the pleural fluid can be mistaken for pericardial fluid and vice versa. Pericardial fluid, of course, should conform with the shape of the heart and be, and be around it, um, and pleural fluid uh, does not do that. <coughs> uh, and just one thing to add here, again, in terms of <coughs> the patient technical obstacles to uh, this part of the exam, uh, familiarity with the, the parasternal views and the anterior chest uh, wall views of the heart uh, really help help clinicians out when uh, it's hard to scan the sub xiphoid window. Uh, so uh, that skill is something that's very uh, useful to develop uh, to, to be comfortable with the fast exam. Looking at the left upper quadrant, uh, once again to remind you that we're not we're not likely to see. Uh, parenchymal or organ injury with a fast exam, uh, so don't expect to see uh, badly injured or damaged uh, sp uh, spleens uh, uh, unless you're seeing free fluid um, that that uh, have accumulated as a result of that. Uh, this here actually is an example of a subcapsular hematoma that was identified in ultrasound. But again, unless one was an experienced sonographer, one might not realize that. Uh, the key point for, the, for the, the introductory fast lecture is that you can see free fluid back here uh, running from the spleen into the splenorenal space here. Here's the kidney, um, and maybe a little bit even more anteriorly up through here. Uh, this white area here is actually clotted subcapsular hematoma, um, but might, might have been mistaken for for soft tissue with, if someone were less, less experienced at this exam. Pitfalls in the left upper quadrant, the splenic hilum and the fluid-filled stomach can both uh, sometimes, uh, until they've been, uh, uh, until the sonographer is, is familiar with these, can sometimes cause confusion. Uh, here is a case of the splenic hilum, the vessels of the splenic hilum are sometimes quite prominent. And this actually, this particular cut makes this vessel appear like it's pointy and speculated, like free fluid. In fact, it's not. Uh, it's a negative exam. And here is someone who came into the trauma bay um, after um, uh, partaking of uh, uh, some volume of beer. And uh, this is a stomach full of uh, free fluid. You can actually see the uh, bubbles uh, rising in the beer here. And this is the head, um, which is causing this uh, comet tail artifact um, from the bubbles that is coming down from this area here. Um, again, contrary to free fluid, this is a roundy appearance that usually is, is allows you to recognize uh, the stomach and its contents. Right here we have a fluid-filled stomach coming in right here, spleen, kidney, but back here you see this area of stomach, uh, which is definitely a physical fluid structure, but uh, unlike fluid, it's kind of roundly in shape, well contained, and you can kind of see the rugae of the stomach, again with maybe some artifact caused by gas, uh, swallowed gas, uh, mixed in with the contents of the stomach. Um, but the first time this is seen, it can sometimes give people's, uh, sorry, people uh, uh, some problems in, in recognizing it for what it is. Moving on to the suprapubic view, the biggest pitfall here is that after scanning the rest of the, the abdomen, you really have to turn your gain settings down. Uh, the bladder is, uh, is a, a fantastic sonographic window, um, and as a result, you get intense through transmission of ultrasound waves behind the bladder, also known as posterior acoustic enhancement. And as a result, the entire area back here gets filled with gain artifact and uh, Free fluid, which should appear black, is is actually uh, 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 blown out by it, and uh, and it can be it can be a failure to recognize it. So adjust your gain when you get in the suprapubic area. The suprapubic area occasionally one sees very prominent, uh, especially in young, 
healthy uh, patients who are susceptible to trauma, prominent psoas muscles here, and they have an appearance almost of fl fluid surrounding clot. Um, and it, again, until you've seen them, uh, one might not be familiar with them. They characteristically have their tendons within the, the mass of the muscle surrounded by the, the um, muscle tissue here. And, and oftentimes they're described as looking a little bit like kidneys with the, with the renal hilum. Obviously, you know they're not kidneys because of the location of the probe. Uh, seminal vesicles, uh, when the gain settings are correct, uh, also can be a, a source of confusion uh, because they appear bilaterally posterior to the bladder uh, in the area where the bow ties are, are seen for, the, for, the, uh, for early uh, uh, hemoperitoneum in the pelvis. And um, here's the prostate scanning uh, superior to the bladder. Here are the seminal vesicles spreading apart. But again, contrary to free fluid, you can see these are roundy, very symmetrical, and exactly the right place. As, as we mentioned before, free fluid is going to be sought just superior to the seminal vesicles. So when you're looking at the seminal vesicles, you're a little bit too far uh, uh, inferior in the pelvis. Uh, you're below the pelvic reflection, so you're not likely to see fluid there. This is a, a, a diagram indicating that, again, reminding you of this, here's the bladder, uh, here are the seminal vesicles. The perineal reflection back here is superior to the seminal vesicles. So uh, if you're scanning through the seminal vesicles, you're actually below the reflection of the perineum, and you're not going to see free fluid in the, in the pelvis as, as a result of that, because you're below where the free fluid can gather. So what order do we recommend that you scan when you do your FAST exam? Um, everyone has a preference. Uh, I find it's best to go in a big clockwise order uh, unless you have any reason uh, to suspect that there's hemopericardium, uh, uh, in which case that can be the, obviously the, the, the thing that can kill the patient most rapidly. In that case, I, I would suggest you look at the pericardium first. But otherwise, the, the vast majority of positive fast exams, uh, there's going to be free fluid in the right upper quadrant. So that's probably the place that's worth checking at the beginning. Um, and after that, it's easy to just take a nice systematic sweep from the right upper quadrant, the sub xiphoid region, the left upper quadrant, and then suprapubic area. So uh, in terms of, of sound technique, again, uh, complete your exam of each region before moving on. You've got to, you've got to stay systematic here. Uh, there are enough things happening in the trauma bay that uh, if, if you lose track of where you are, uh, you're going to overlook things and, and miss them. So complete each region that we've discussed and complete an exam of each potential space in each region before moving on. So make sure you get all four in the right up quadrant, a good look at the anterior and posterior pericardium and the sub -cyphoid. all four in the left upper quadrant, and then a good look in the res re retrovesicular space uh, uh, or the retrouterine space um, in turn. The order of the potential spaces within each region really doesn't matter. Oftentimes you put your probe down, you find you've got a great view of the splenorenal or the heptorenal space. Interrogate the space completely from side to side or from top to bottom and then, then look at the other potential spaces in that region. Uh, if you're obtaining still images for QA, uh, do so in a separate, a separate sweep. Uh, because if you're an uh, operating machine and uh, freezing and recording images, uh, it interrupts your ability to do systematic scanning. And the, uh, once again, the power of, of uh, this device really to give you a, a really thorough uh, exam in, in trauma is in its real-time scanning through all the tissue planes. So uh, again, in, in kind of uh, summary of, of technique, uh, avoid the temptation to, ru to rush the FAST exam. Uh, when you get accomplished at it, you'll probably be able to do a good FAST exam for most patients in 45 seconds. But uh, during the time when you're uh, on the learning curve, uh, a, a, uh, a thorough FAST exam will take you a little bit longer, but uh, the value of it obviously will far exceed a more rushed exam in which you overlook free fluid. Um, there's a nice article written in the journal Trauma 
by Dr. Biffle, uh, in which she called FAST should be slow, which stands for Systematic Look for Occult Hemorrhage, uh, which really is, is systematic, methodical scanning in real time. Maintain your peripheral vision, like, like when you look at a chest x-ray, um, notice around the edges of, of your image and always be on the out, lookout for uh, dark areas on your scan, uh, the, the token free fluid. Uh, don't forget, once again, this thing should be thought of as a handheld CT scanner and should be as methodical as a CT scanner is with its gantry, um, so that the systematic real-time scanning through all tissue planes. Uh, the, again, there obviously are uh, organs uh, and, and, and sites in the uh, peritoneum and chest where the free fluid is expected in the vessels, the gallbladder, etc. Um, the key is that free fluid compared to physiologic fluid tends to be pointy. Again, here's kidney, liver, here is a pointy area of fluid in Morrison's pouch. Um, free fluid slips between the loops of bowel and viscera and any other structures and tends to create these, these pointy shapes. Um, and conversely, if you look at this free fluid which is hanging out, or is this fluid rather, this fluid filled structure that's hanging out under the liver, uh, you can see it's roundy in quality and if you scan through it you realize that it was limited and roundy in all directions and we recognize it for the gallbladder. Conversely, again, here's the bladder. You can see the roundy shape of the bladder. Uh, on either side here, these two pointy triangles of fluid um, in front of the, 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 uh, the uterus here. Um, this actually is free fluid, abnormal free fluid, and a positive fast exam. Uh, ascites tends to be more sonolucent than blood, um, and usually, uh, can be recognized in the clinical context. Um, our patients with liver disease uh, obviously often come in with skin findings that are consistent with that. They're often in an older age group um, and oftentimes they have uh, findings in the liver with evidence of cirrhosis that are consistent with that. This is a very clear fluid surrounding many loops of bowel here. This is ascites. Clotted blood uh, uh, is something that, again, until you've seen it a little, uh, a few times, uh, can can be uh, the, the cause of a uh, false negative fast exam because it actually has soft tissue density, and fresh blood starts to clot within minutes. And I'll show you an example of that coming up. Um, clot can be hyperechoic, and uh, and often has sort of a, a poorly defined mottled appearance, which, again, to the inexperienced eye, might lo not look dissimilar from bowel and bowel contents. Um, it's going to be 12 to 2 days before, 12 hours to 2 days before the, uh, the clot uh, um, fibrinolysis and becomes sonolucent. This actually is an example of a, a patient who was uh, pedestrian struck right outside the hospital. Um, he came in within minutes of being struck and had this fast exam done within minutes of his arrival, probably within 10 minutes of the original accident. Um, he was in, uh, uh, he was, he was in uh, near arrest with no blood pressure uh, and uh, 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 no pulses, um, but on ultrasound had a uh, hyperdynamic heart identifiable here, surrounded by this pericardium full of completely clotted blood, again within minutes of, uh, of, the, fast, of, of the accident. Um, this patient received an open thoracotomy in the ED, um, the clot was removed, vital signs returned, uh, he was taken to the OR where his, uh, his cardiac injury um, was repaired and, and, and he, he walked out of the hospital uh, with full neurological uh, function um, uh, less than two weeks later. Uh, so this was definitely a case where the FAST exam uh, helped us uh, to save a critically ill person. Uh, here's a, a, a clip showing clotted blood in the pelvis. Here's a large clot right here, surrounded by areas of non-clotted or fibrinolyzed blood. Um, and this is, this is, we've just gone sagittal on the image at the end there. Um, and you'll be able to see when we get the sagittal view, um, if I pause it right here, you can see the bladder, the dome of the bladder right here, and you can see the clot and the blood going anterior to it. So remember I mentioned to you that clot in the pelvis can be posterior to the bladder, above the bladder or in front of the bladder, or all three. 
Perinephric fat uh, is uh, something that can easily be confused uh, with free fluid. It's usually not dark, but as we've said, uh, so it, can, it shouldn't be mistaken for free fluid, but it can be mistaken for clotted blood, as we've, we just saw a couple of examples of clot, and, and they're frequently hyperechoic. Um, perinephric fat tends to be uh, fairly homogeneously surrounding the kidneys, um, uh, although occasionally it can be pointy, as in this case here. Um, the, uh, in order to reassure yourself that it is perinephric fat, you should make sure that this is consistent with the patient's body habitus. You don't usually see this on patients that are, have an asthenic habitus, uh, number one. Number two, both sides should be pretty much symmetrical. People don't tend to develop perinephric fat on one side and not the other. Um, and if you really, really have any question, you can roll the patient on one side, and if it's free fluid, it's going to either drain or increase, uh, depending on whether that, patient, that side is up or down, uh, whereas perinephric fat won't change. Uh, perinephric fat also has these internal echoes, uh, which kind of have a, a, a signature which is different from that homogeneous uh, uh, signature of the uh, of, of clot that we we saw in the previous two slides. So, what are the likely causes of false negative fast exams? Uh, and I, I went through ten peer-reviewed articles, uh, uh, the 10 that we discussed at the very beginning of the lecture, and looked at all the cases that they, in, in which they, uh, they acknowledged that they'd had a false negative fast exam. That there were almost 6,000 patients in the 10 articles. Um, 98, uh, they had 98 clinically significant false negative fast exams reported. Um, the, um, uh, by clinically significant, uh, we're going to find that as something that needed operative repair. A full third of those are hollow viscous injuries, uh, which, which is uh, the type of injury that is, is, uh, tends to be missed also by CT scan um, and may or may not be picked up by DPL, but it's definitely in, in all the imaging modalities and diagnostic modalities available in trauma, this is the, the type of injury that tends to be most easily overlooked. Um, 23% or a quarter were splenic, 14% uh, were liver lacerations or, or injuries, um, and 11% were diaphragmatic, 10% uh, were hemothoraces. Uh, the majority of them evolved more than 24 hours after injury, so they probably were not really true negatives in the sense that they were, the fast exam was accurate uh, at the time it was done. Uh, and, and many were clinically identifiable, so the patients w became unstable, um, and in other cases, uh, repeat ultrasounds revealed, revealed the, uh, uh, the diagnosis. So um, using the strictest criteria, as we mentioned, the sensitivity is going to be between 80 and 90 percent. But uh, uh, using clinical acumen and repeat exams, uh, uh, probably the sensitivity uh, or the likelihood of, of false negative studies is much lower than 10 to 20 percent. False positive exams are going to be caused uh, by ascites and pleural effusions, uh, retroperitoneal and pelvic hematomas may, may uh, uh, masquerade as uh, positive fast exams, although clinically, obviously, we want to know about them anyway, so it uh, wouldn't be a false positive that was bad for us to know about or the patient to have us know about. Um, again, false positives will often be accompanied by clinical findings that, that corroborate them. Uh, when, when should you consider doing false, uh, sorry, repeat fast exams? Um, really you can repeat fast exams as often as you want and as you become more facile at them the downside of repeating the exam becomes less and less because you're going to spend less and less time invested in doing it. Um, uh, if you have a stable patient with an initially negative fast that you want to send home uh, uh, without any further studies you might consider uh, observing them for six hours, and if they're stable, repeating the fast exam. Um, uh, there's a couple of studies that have looked at this. Um, uh, in Porter, uh, out of 105 patients with negative uh, repeat fast, he found that none of them needed laps, um, and he also found that the positive, a repeat fast that was positive led to laparotomy in 40% of patients. Um, 
uh, obviously still some of those people were just having sympathetic per peritoneal effusions or pleural effusions from contusions or uh, or, or, or non-operative inter in internal organ uh, injuries uh, that didn't require operative repair. Um, and um, uh, Glazer also found that the uh, repeat fast exam was, was useful uh, in the setting of uh, delayed splenic rupture um, in people who were being followed conservatively. So this is a case in which we actually got a repeat exam, although it was um, initially the patient was uh, had a clear sensorium and uh, uh, tachycardia, but normal blood pressure and a negative left up goddard exam. Uh, the patient subsequently became diaphoretic, uh, restless, blood pressure dropped, heart rate went up, and and this extremely abnormal left up goddard exam that we've seen once before this lecture. Uh, uh, was obtained, uh, which really showed clotted blood all through the left upper quadrant with it's difficulty making out any recognizable anatomic structures in this, in this uh, view. How much volume are we going to be able to pick up, or how small a volume of, of free fluid in the FAST exam? We've mentioned uh, the Goldberg study of 1970. Um, in 1990, uh, Tying did a, a study of volumes and he estimated that a five millimeter stripe, a five millimeter stripe in Morrison's pouch uh, represented 500 cc's of free fluid. Um, and Brainy uh, uh, determined that, that uh, only 50% of his patients had identifiable free fluid in Morrison pouch after 600 cc's, um, but 97% were positive after 1,000 cc's. So again, there's, there's some a uh, range uh, of, of numbers uh, in the literature, uh, probably uh, the bottom line is that between 500 and 1,000 cc's of free fluid should be clearly identifiable with ultrasound. And if there's any question in your mind, repeat scans, put the patient in Trendelenburg, put the patient on their right side, uh, could all be things that would help you uh, figure out if you're looking at a small amount of free fluid or not. Uh, it's also true that the larger the volume of free fluid identified, the more likely the patient has for need for the OR. Um, so that's also something that if you're in a hospital where you're calling in a surgeon, uh, then the, the, your sense of how thick the stripe is in Morrison, Morrison's pouch or elsewhere really has prognostic significance in terms of the care the patient needs surgically. There are several other issues in the FAST exam, uh, which we're not going to cover in this lecture. Uh, the pneumothorax, evaluation for pneumothorax, which is uh, uh, widely performed nowadays, uh, probably uh, or, or definitely in, in our experience um, more accurate than the chest x-ray, uh, but less accurate than the CT. Uh, how many of those are clinically significant uh, is disputed. Uh, uh, the FAST exam in pediatrics, uh, the FAST exam in penetrating trauma, this talk is primarily focused on, uh, on a blunt trauma to the torso. Uh, specific organ injuries, uh, some uh, investigators have reported success in assessing, assessing this with the FAST and training issues. So let's just uh, think about how the FAST exam now is going to be integrated with the rest of the trauma evaluation. First of all, we're going to do it after the primary survey. So um, if the patient is shocked, you can do it with the concurrent with the C of ABC when you're evaluating circulation. Otherwise, you do it uh, concurrent with the, the D uh, evaluation uh, for disability. Um, uh, if possible, do it prior to the insertion of the Foley. Uh, that's less of an issue now than it used to be when uh, the standard of care was to put Foley's in the majority of trauma patients uh, regardless. Um, nowadays, that's definitely uh, uh, no longer the practice. Um, and um, if you're unsure about what you're seeing, uh, repeat the FAST exam in 15 minutes or less and observe the clinical, the patient's clinical status. So when, you've, when you do the FAST exam, you want to come away from the bedside with one of the three, these three categories in your head to either report to the surgeon 
or uh, to uh, determine your own uh, steps as the as the treating physician yourself. Either the, the first exam is positive for free fluid, yes, it's a positive exam, or no, it's a negative exam. And finally, since we're all clinicians and we know that diagnostic tests work this way, the third category is I don't know. And obviously it's very important for us to acknowledge when we don't know something uh, and that's far more useful than being falsely positive or falsely negative. So an indeterminate exam is also a result that you have to acknowledge. Um, you're going to combine whichever of these things, whichever of these categories the patient falls into with the clinical condition uh, and that's going to determine the next step which is either the OR stat or further diagnostic studies or neither which will be clinical management. So putting this all together if you're looking at a hemodynamically unstable patient it's, it's coming to your, your, uh, your uh, trauma bay and you have a positive fast exam then you should, that patient should be taken to the OR for laparotomy pretty much. If the fast exam is negative, then peritoneal hemorrhage and, and, and hemothorax and uh, hemopericardium are probably not the cause. So if you're still uh, concerned about that, you're going to repeat the ultrasound in five minutes or do a DPL, but most likely there's something else involved like uh, massive pelvic hemorrhage, retroperitoneal hemorrhage, um, long bone fracture in the thigh which, which can cause the loss of uh, liters of blood and cause uh, hemodynamic instability. Finally, if you don't know, then you're going to repeat the ultrasound in five minutes and or do DPL and or go to the operating room. Obviously you're not going to usually send a hemodynamically unstable patient to the CAT scanner for further studies over there because that's uh, frequently a, a recipe for disaster. If you have a hemodynamically stable patient that's come into your trauma bay and is lying on the gurney in front of you and your fast is positive for free fluid or, or fluid elsewhere then you probably have the luxury of getting more uh, definitive uh, imaging studies to tell you the location and, 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 the, and some organ specific information about the trauma. Uh, most commonly in uh, the United States where CT is readily available that will be CT uh, but uh, elsewhere, if CT is not available, uh, that might require uh, laparotomy or it might require DPL or further clinical serial observations. If the FAST is negative, uh, if you have a high clinical suspicion, then you can certainly get further imaging studies with a hemodynamically stable patient. If you have a low clinical suspicion, then you can manage clinically. You can either observe the patient and or discharge them from uh, either the trauma bay or your uh, emergency department. Finally, uh, if the FAST is indeterminate, again, if you have a high clinical suspicion, get further studies, CT or, or any other that's available, and with low clinical suspicion, uh, repeat the FAST, or if you have this available and the luxury of doing this, uh, obtain a CT scan to confirm your impressions. Okay, if uh, there are any questions or comments, uh, I'm, I'm available to answer them uh, through the website, um, which is written on the slide.